high school, I was very much fearful of being kicked out by my family. It's hard in the Asian American community because when you come from another country to America, the last thing you want for your family is for them to feel like their effort to move to America is wasted, um, to feel shame or feeling like a failure coming to the States because their son all of a sudden is gay. You are named one of Boston's most influential men of color in 2023. And that for me is a hugely significant accolade. Being a queer AAPI person, uh, we are a political statement. Welcome to Meaningful. Marketing, mentoring, mattering. With me, Joseph Alcantara. Together, we'll uncover the power of purpose experience mentorship magic, unpack ways to make a difference, and find transformative journeys as a community. Welcome to Meaningful, Marketing, Mentoring, Mattering, with me, Joseph Alcantara. This month, we're celebrating pride and honoring the LGBTQ plus community's profound impact on society. Join us as we explore stories of courage, authenticity, trailblazing contributions and how the community's involvement shapes a more inclusive world. Before we dive in, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and notification bell so you are updated every time we have a new episode. Today, our very special guest is Harris Zhao, an R&D engineer turned social impact executive working on several nonprofits while serving as chief of strategy for Get Connected a multicultural connection accelerator, and the president of the National Association of Asian American Professionals. Harris is also the queer son of Chinese immigrants and is the founder of Pride Talks, a podcast for AAPI queer professionals and the Future Pride Leader Scholarship, which is given to a rising undergraduate students identifying as LGBTQ+. He's an active trainer and leadership coach for rising multicultural community leaders in Boston, including Asian Affinity Employee Resource Groups, youth groups such as CARE and Minds Matter, and has coached over 50 AAPI professionals across industries and companies. Harris was named one of NAP's outstanding leaders in the nation and one of Boston's most influential people of color for the work he does in raising the bar for multicultural communities. Please welcome to the pod, Harris Shao. Hi, Harris. Hello. Thank you for the warm introduction. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Reading your bio, your profile is like very much intrigued, but also at the same time, I cannot help but relate to everything that you know I've read because your story, I think, resonates to a lot of people. Um, but I want to hear it straight from you. I want to ask you the first same question that I ask all my guests, and that is, what is your meaningful life story? Take us back to your background, your lived experience, and your origin story, and how that led you to where you are and what you're doing today. All right, let's see if I can do it justice. So I started off um, in the Chinese immigrant family. My parents didn't come with a lot of money. They came from Khoisan, China. And they didn't come from the city part, they came from the village part. And the village part, we call that Heronghe. Um, And so as they grew up, they went from village, rural side, um, into Taishan, the city side. And then over, all of a sudden, my mom actually decided to move to America. Um, This was all while she's dating my father. My father didn't know, oh, did he want to come to America too? Um, And my, my mom's side had this awesome opportunity, Um, had a person who was living in Argentina who just moved to California. Um, can move the entire family over for new opportunities, for new um, adventures. And so she and her family said yes. And my dad ultimately um, said yes, too. He chased after the woman he loved, came over to the United States. Um, unfortunately, he left behind a lot of things. He left behind his family. He left behind his profession. He left behind his friends and family um, and the work that he was doing over there in Kaisan. And so uh, as we come to the United States, it wasn't easy for my parents. Um, growing up in their 20s and their 30s, um, they were trying to make ends meet. 
And my father was a had a civil engineering degree um, back in China, but when he came to America, um, he started off as a contractor, a construction worker, um, and started managing construction projects. And my mom um, came to the United States and became an electrical components manufacturer um, technician. And so she was working in one of the industrial um, warehouses, manufacturing these electrical components. Um, and then all of a sudden, her role got, um, or actually her entire uh, warehouse got laid off. And so my mom ended up not being um, in service anymore and um, had to find another job. My dad at the time also didn't have uh, enough company and business to make ends meet. And so for a very long part of my childhood, um, we were living in poverty. And so as I kind of grew up, um, went to high school, went to college, um, I went the traditional route. I want engineering. I say traditional because it's a stereotype and it might be true or it might not be true that many Asians go into the engineering field because it's financially secure. It's financially stable. And as immigrant people coming to another country, the thing that we want is just knowing that we are safe. And so I went the traditional route. I went to engineering, came out of engineering, went into pharmaceutical sciences and R&D. Um, had a financially stable, relatively um, organized and non-chaotic life um, as a pharmaceutical project manager. And it wasn't until, I'd say, really, it wasn't until the pandemic. Um, it wasn't really until anti-Asian hate was a real thing um, that I became more aware of my own work, my own effort, and my own identity. Um, and I'll, I'll share with you that my grandma had passed away during the pandemic. And she passed away due to total organ failure. It's um, and we don't know what happened. We heard um stories from her neighbors um that she was on the floor. She might have been pushed, and she was um not in the right state of mind or something like that. And she's an older woman. Uh, she was at least in her um she was in her eighties. And so when we got the final report and we um. My grandma had passed away and we got the death certificate. I, in kind of emotional distress, asked myself, what am I going to do about this? And so during that time, I also then accepted the position of becoming the president of the National Association of Asian American Professionals. Um, I doubled down on what it meant to be a queer Asian American. And I doubled down on doing social impact work, community work, civil work, because things like this happen to everyone. And we are in America. We are in a racially motivated, racially politicized um, country. And things like this happen where our race, our identity, the way that we look, and the way that we dress, the person that we are on the inside is going to be criticized. It's going to be um, othered. And so I took on the work to do this at the National Association of Asian American Professionals. Um, I also left my role in pharmaceuticals. I'm in my corporate day job as an R&D project manager and engineer. Um, and went all the way into social impact. I doubled down on it. Um, eventually, I made it into Get Connected, a multicultural connection accelerator uh, founded by Colette Phillips, who is one of the super connectors and one of Boston's most influential people of color. And so um, that is where I am today. Wow, Harris, that story. Well, first of all, I'm sorry to hear about your grandma. Um, my condolences. I know that a lot of us lost our loved ones during the pandemic. Um, but the way you were able to pivot, the way that you were able to find silver lining after that loss in your family and how you were able to pick up the pieces and use that for your advantage and for the advantage of the community and what you're doing right now is really noble, admirable, and really very inspiring. Um, I cannot help but also relate because I'm also part of the AAPI community and also part of the LGBTQ plus community. And um, we just celebrated the AAPI Heritage Month last month, and we're celebrating Pride Month this month. Um, I want to ask your thoughts around the two months, the back-to-back -back celebration that I see is very relevant to who you are and what you stand for and your totality. Um, what do these months mean to you and how significant are they to you? Yeah, I'm going to steal a quote from my own director of Pride at the Boston chapter, um, Cindy Trong. Um, and they say that being a queer AAPI person, uh, we are a political statement because years ago, decades ago, we weren't allowed to be who we were. We were 
here, we knew who we were. Um, people who were AAPI, people who were LGBTQ+, we knew who we are, were, but we weren't being recognized um, legally. We weren't being recognized at all. Um, so me being here today with you, Joseph, it's a political statement saying that we are here. We are now more than ever wanting to be heard, wanting to be seen. And now I'm going to challenge our community, um, both the AAPI and the LGBTQ plus community to now be demanding to be felt and respected. So that means a lot of different things. For the um, for both um, parts of my identity, it means being in rooms that we weren't allowed to be in before. It is also being able to speak up for others who are also in this community when they don't have the privilege or opportunity to do so. And it's about asking for fairness and asking for our own people and our own communities to tell our own stories. Because we, at the end of the day, don't want anyone else to tell the stories of our own identities because that, one, dilutes the value of our stories, and two, it's not authentic. And so we demand for representation, a real representation, because we can't have another person uh, from a different culture, a different background, being us. And that we need to be the representation and we need to be in those positions for ourselves. So that's what the, those two months mean to me. It's about celebration, yes. Um, but it's also about reclaiming um, our goals and objectives to make sure that we are standing in different rooms um, to be seen and heard and now to be felt and respected. That is great to hear. I think for folks who are listening to us today who can identify as AAPI or LGBTQ+, or both, um, if they're wondering, okay, Joseph Harris... I embrace my identity when it comes to this intersectionality, but I'm not like you. I'm not at that stage that would allow me to be in that open situation, especially understanding my family dynamics, the stage where I'm at, you know, I'm probably younger. For example, I am being raised by a relatively conservative family. You know, going back to your personal story, growing up with a first generation immigrant parents, I know that coming out probably was not easy. What would be your suggestions or your words of inspiration or, you know, guiding principles for the relatively younger folks who are probably not experiencing the same level of freedom? that we are experiencing today that will enable and help them to navigate this relatively tough journey. I look at, at I look at this phenomenon of freedom and liberty as elusive. I mean, even asking ourselves are we truly free is something very deeply and profoundly philosophical. And so when I look at um the young audience members who are watching this podcast, I say my advice is to treat it as a marathon. The work that we do to demand respect and demand representation, it's a long-term goal. Um, many people that I've talked to in my circles, um, for example, in 2022, during that Lunar New Year's event, um, I was, uh, we were hosting in Boston um, the first time ever Boston's most influential Asian American Pacific Islander people. That was the first time we've ever said, hey, who are the most influential community leaders, the civic leaders, the political leaders, but also the corporate leaders and uh, people who are rising leaders who are really demonstrating that they are the representation um, that we want and need to be seen um, in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. And so when we did that event, um, it was sort of like this, this moment where some of the older generation folks said, never in my lifetime had I ever dreamed of finally coming to see this in action and in place. And so I'm thinking about myself, and I'm about to turn 30. When I turn 40 in another decade, I hope to see our community also rise up to another milestone to continue to be seen. Maybe at that point, we'll hit parody. We'll hit finally seeing people like ourselves in movies and in television shows and all of that. Um, but I say, and I'd advocate for our younger folks to continue learning, um, but also be patient. It is a marathon. Yes, be urgent. Yes, be and be completely all in and completely understand what your role is. Um, but be patient in this journey because the train has been in motion for a longer time than you have thought. 
it has been. And so we just have to keep um, waiting for our turn. Um, but also while we are waiting, continue to demand and ask for us to be inside of those rooms. That is great wisdom there, Harris, because I think, especially when it comes to um, the previous generations, they've done everything that they can. They've paved the way for us to be discussing this openly right now. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's not an overnight thing. We were able to kind of have like leaps and bounds when it comes to the progress of where we are today. But definitely, we still have a lot to do. But I love your thought about treating it as a marathon and not a sprint, and also being patient about how younger folks will be able to see the full fruition of what we are aiming to aspire and to have, hopefully in the coming years or generations. I think, you know, that is very powerful because ultimately, if we will continue to do what we're doing, never stop, never surrender, but not really be impatient about wanting everything today, mm -hmm. I think that will be very, very helpful. Um, the other thing that really sparked attention to me when I read your profile is the fact that you're named one of Boston's most influential men of color in 2023. And that for me is a hugely significant accolade that should be very inspiring for younger folks as well. How do you feel this recognition impacting your work, particularly in the DEI community building that you are 100% on now? And how are you using that so that you can leverage that as an opportunity to lift the entire community, both the AAPI and the LGBTQ plus communities? Okay, this is a very hard question, but I'll do my best to answer it. Um, so when I was named one of Boston's most influential men of color, I immediately went back to five years ago when I was on a train ride with the then president of the National Association of Asian American Professionals. She was asking, oh, Harris, in five years, what are your plans? Do you one day want to be the president? Do you one day want to be a community leader? Um, and I remember saying to her, no, I absolutely do not want to be in this role. Um, I want to be the person who leads from the back. I wanted to be the person who um, uplifted others. And I was very okay with that. And then as I go through my life and as I'm taking small steps to be public and to speak out for what's right and what is just, um, I ended up moving hearts and hands, as I call it. Um, and as I do that, I remember a vivid and distinct memory um, with this person named Josh. Um, they are a transgendered uh, Filipina who um, I was friends with but didn't know very well until we met at Club Cafe, which is one of our gear, um, queer bars um, here in Boston. At that queer bar, they came up to me and um, confessed that seeing Harris, you on stage, meant a lot. To finally see someone who can represent our community at that high level and also to do it with good grace and with communication and with wisdom meant a lot. And it was at in that moment that the club um, all sort of almost randomly, it, it, it said to me that I needed to continue my work um, because people are paying attention. Um, and not just people who are outsiders, but people on the inside who are paying attention to what we are doing. And when we see ourselves on screen or being represented um, on the stage or wherever we are, it's something that, that lingers inside of you. It says to you, one day, maybe I can do that as well. Um, or maybe one day my own story could be seen and heard and I don't need to keep explaining myself or I don't need to keep coming out of the closet to every single person I meet or I maybe seeing someone else tell that story could also mean finally like people can understand in a different way what I've been feeling and what I've been witnessing and what I've been understanding and kind of committing to my entire life. And so in that way, by being named one of Boston's most influential men of color in 2023, um, that was a milestone to me that said I needed to continue doing this um, because if it wasn't for me, then who else would take on this role? And if it wasn't now, um, then when were we going to continue asking for 
that stage. Um, and I remember the roster of those most influential men of color. It was, there were not a lot of Asians. I was one of the few Asians. I was probably also one of the few LGBT plus people on that list. Um, so I was very grateful to be recognized and seen and honored. Um, I know that there's still a lot of work left to do to make sure that other people in these, boat, in these two very proud communities um, to continue to be seen for having their work be seen. That is great. The award is a huge thing and being able to represent both communities so that we can be heard and be seen and be taken seriously. And having you as our representative um, is really very helpful, beneficial, and um, really very inspiring. But what really struck me the most when you were narrating that story was that the triggers and the decisions came from conversations. You were talking to NAP Boston's president in a train ride five years ago. And then some, after you said no to her, you were talking to, you know, a fellow as part of the committee in one of the best places in Boston, Club Cafe, and made you realize that, okay, I need to move forward and not just think about myself, but really find ways to serve the greater good and the bigger community. And that kind of attitude, I think, is something that a lot of folks, especially in our community, should emulate and should try to discern and understand because the growth and the success of our community, it doesn't lie on individuals themselves alone, but really um, us as a collective working together and inspiring each other and working for each other. That made me think that, you know, you are driven by passion you're driven by inspiring others you are driven by serving the the community um, but i want to hear it directly from you i mean what inspires you to do what you're doing to give up your nine to five as a project manager and r d engineer and really focus solely on social work on leadership and advocacy what's that challenge and was that journey hard and how did you navigate that journey for yourself yeah good question to this day i still feel very awkward in front of people i still feel very much like i am not meant to be up on stage in front of all these people quote unquote giving inspirational talks or or, or sharing um inspirational messages to this day, I still feel like my job is in the background. My job is uplifting other people. And that my job is to make sure that people are seen um, for who they are. And, and so it still feels weird, Joseph, to be on a podcast like yours, um, to be on stage at the National Convention for our association. And so when you ask me what inspires me to do this, I'm going to go back to it's every single person that I've met in my life who I know really that they have a story. Um, when I say story, I don't mean necessarily like this big inspirational grandiose story, but I mean everyone has a reason for them being who they are and them being in the place that they are now. Um, and I find that my job as a leader is not about me. It's not about Harris. It's not about what I can do for others, um, but rather what I can do to make sure others are seen. And when I say others are seen, I mean, there are so many stories out there of people who um, have been often underheard, underseen, underrepresented. Um, and so my job um, and the work that I do is to make sure that when I, when, especially in the AAPI community, let's just speak it to it specifically the AA community, um, that every single person in the AAPI community can feel like they can belong. Um, what this means is that you can both be unapologetically Asian, but you can also be Asian enough because in this new decade or in this new generation, um, being Asian can mean a lot of different things. It can mean you're from West Asia. It can mean you're Palestinian. It can mean that you are a transnational adoptee and you were born in a different country, but raised in a different family and a different culture. Um, but what that means to me is that when you are a part of our Asian American community, my role, um, Harris's role as a leader, is to make sure that everyone feels like they belong. Um, so with that, I made sure um, with my efforts and my power and my resources that I was able to start the first 
LGBTQ plus pride scholarship for a deserving high school senior, because we need more leadership training for youths um, all the way from the beginning of their high school careers. Um, so that when they rise up, when they go to university, they have the resources, the mentorship, and also the dollars to make sure that they are having an equitably um, and financially stable education. And then um, I also look at the start of our Adoptees Unity Committee, which we launched last year in August at our national convention, where finally we said um, to our Pan-Asian adoptees mm -hmm. that they belong, that this Asian community who may not have seen adoptees for who they are for a long time, they belong here. And so that's the work that I really believe matters. It's the work that I believe people care about. It's not about you or I. It's not about the singular. It's about the community. It's about the we. It's about the us. That's amazing. And I think being able to create um, structured and tangible programs with specific impact that really drive or help others, especially, you know, their future for the younger folks. It's a great legacy that you and the organization can provide. And hopefully the next generation can also continue. And I also love the fact that you've mentioned about the different sub-segments or sectors within our community, because it, we're not just like AAPI in general. They're like different stories behind that label. And it's something that cannot be generalized. So we need to find ways to represent each other and make sure that we all belong. It's not necessarily finding ways to fit in, but really to truly belong for our differences and our similarities. Um, and I'm sure that with everything that you're doing, which are all good, you're very, very busy. You're trying to be everything for everyone all at once how do you keep that energy how do you keep yourself motivated and how do you make sure that you leave certain aspects for yourself as well because you cannot serve everyone if you're not serving yourself this is a question i struggle with all the time what matters most to you and why are you prioritizing that now versus later and it's not about doing everything it's about choosing to do the things that matter the most at this moment in your life. And in this moment of my life, the thing that matters is visibility and representation. Number one, because we are on an accelerated um, pathway. We have had momentum from so many different aspects um, that we cannot let go because Asian Americans for a very long time have just been underseen, have not been respected in different circles. And even just um, in the last two decades or two years, um, Asian American people who are now finally considered as not a model minority. And we continue to break that mold through representation on TV screens and in movies. I mean, so in this moment of my life, I want to continue down that road to make sure that Asian American and Pacific Islanders are most importantly, all of us can be seen and all of us can be um, represented, whether it's by ourselves, for ourselves, or for other people. Um, Number two, I think the other priority that matters most to me is to continue to move hearts and hands so that a multicultural community can really be a, a defining feature in our country. When I say that, um, I really mean Boston as a city, one of Boston's greatest secrets and greatest weapons um, as a community is our diversity. And I think so many different states and so many different communities can really take Boston as a role model for how they develop business and also how they develop structures and organizations for all of their people to not just survive, but for them to thrive. Um, so my work at Get Connected is all about multicultural connection acceleration, which really at the core of it means access, access to different networks. If you're a person of color, there may be challenges for you in your professional career from moving from an associate to a manager level role, or maybe from a manager role to an executive. Um, but our role in Get Connected is to make sure that every person who comes to our organization um, has access to networks that they may not have had access to um, before. Those are great. And I think I love how you've structured it in such a way that it's impact based and you're finding ways to build on the momentum that we were able to start like three, four years ago after the pandemic, like literally strike while the iron is hot, which like 
I think makes perfect sense, especially for our community and for, for the city of Boston as well, which I fully support and agree with you 100%. Shout out to Mayor Michelle Wu because she's really making strides when it comes to showcasing that having a diverse and fully equitable city is like a potential powerhouse and a secret weapon that any state or any city can have to make it continuously thrive and flourish. But on the flip side though, I'm sure that it's not better for us all the time. Um, I'm sure that there are tons of challenges along the way that you're also facing, um, especially that now you're very much involved with Get Connected as a strategy officer there, right? Even if you're providing you know, those access for the resources that folks like us mm -hmm. would be needing. What are these typical challenges that folks like us in the AAPI community and LGBTQ plus community are probably experiencing? The reason why I want to ask this question is because for folks who are listening to us, for them to realize that they are not alone in their situation, that the challenges are actually common. What are these challenges and how can we help each other to be able to hold hands and be there for each other? The number one thing that sticks out to me is opportunity gap. Uh, when I say opportunity gap, I mean, when you look at a 2015 study, they, the study was looking at people of color and they were looking at people of color rising to different roles inside of organizations. At the very bottom roles, your associate roles, your technician roles, um, on those roles, yes, like we have parity. Asian Americans have parity. People of color have parity, um, which meant that there are um, enough Asian Americans as there are um, Asian Americans in the United States. And so uh, when we look at, okay, when we go from associate levels to now manager levels, uh, we, see a, we see a drop in representation and parity uh, for people of color. Asian Americans, yes, more so than other um, ethnic groups. Um, Asian Americans um, then drop another significant amount when you go um, look for parity from the uh, manager roles to director roles and director roles to um, C-suite level roles. Um, Asian Americans are not paritable um, when it comes to representation at the C-suite level. Um, the, the diversity is even more less seen um, for people of color in those executive roles. For example, I would even say that um, neurodiverse or even disabled um, professionals are not represented in the C-suite at all, even though they are a part of our communities. Um, Asian Americans, when you just look at the numbers, we don't have enough executives inside of those positions who can represent Asian Americans um, at that rank. Um, and sure, yes, in Asia, there are a ton of Asian CEOs. There are a ton of Asian C-suite members. But here in America, where the problem lies is that our organizations are operating in a bubble, in a silo. And when we don't have representation at those levels, it means that products and services don't often represent us at the at um in the right ways. And so um, that is one of the, the challenges that the National Association of Asian American Professionals is really doubling down on so that we make sure that people of color, um, especially Asian American and Pacific Islanders, have access to resources, to trainings, um, and to a network to get them into those further positions. Um, yes, we are making strides. Yes, we are bringing people of color into all these different types of positions, uh, but we need to continue doing that. Um, and we need to continue doing that because all of us matter. We need to get diverse people inside of those roles and we should not settle for just good enough. We should settle to, um, to make sure that all of us can finally be represented, um, if not by um, taking up space in already existing seats, um, but then making our own tables and our own seats um, so that we can sit at those positions. And when I think of the LGBTQ plus community, I'm thinking a lot about making sure that the LGBTQ plus experience, especially in our youth, are well supported or well seen. Um, I'll be very honest, when I was um, in high school, I was very much fearful of being kicked out by my family. And had it not been for me hiding who I was until I turned 23, until I graduated with a nice salary and a stable career, um, then when I could fully come out, um, I was scared. I was scared of losing everything I had. Um, and it's hard in the Asian American community because when you come from another country to America, the last thing you want for your family is for them to feel like they're 
effort to move to America is wasted. Um, to feel shame for feeling like a failure coming to the States because their son all of a sudden is gay and he can't give birth to um, another child or he can't have a normal life or he can't have a family of his own. All of that brings shame. And so um, one of the other things I want to make sure that we do in the LGBT plus AAPI community is for us to recognize that our youths need to be supported from a very early age um, and that they should feel protected because when you are safe and protected, you can finally um, accept the challenge of being a leader because when you are safe and when you feel um, respected, that's when the real work happens. That's when you finally can move um, the needle and finally can make a difference. Wow. I mean, I love how you're able to crystallize, Harris, the problem and the solutions that we're trying to push forward for both um, communities or for one as well. You know, for AAPI in general, being able to identify the problem or the challenge when it comes to, you know, just recognition and fair treatment, especially when it comes to our professional lives and then progressing continuously in our career ladders and having a resource for folks who are probably, you know, in that particular dilemma or situation. And then on the LGBTQ plus community, especially the younger folks, I can very well relate to your story because in our generation, I think that being gay or being queer during that time was treated as a liability when it comes to, you know, the AAPI family, thinking that you are not enough. But I think, you know, folks who are listening to us today should realize that we are here as your elder folks who have been in that same journey. We'll try our very best to push forward to keep everyone safe to do what we can to support the next generations so they wouldn't be experiencing the same kind of challenge or hurt or pain that our generation experienced. Mm -hmm. Which leads me now, sadly, to my last question to you, Harris. <laughs> we started with what your meaningful like life story was growing up, your origin story and your background. In a roundabout way, I want to ask you the same Last question that I ask all my guests, and that is, what does a meaningful life mean to you? And how do you live that every single day of your life? Meaning life, a meaningful life to me means that while I'm living, I'm happy. You know, when we are born in this world, I mean, I'm repeating a quote from one of my role models, um, Bing Chen, who is the CEO and founder of Gold House. Um, when we come into this world, we have nothing. And when we leave this world, we have nothing. And so to me, a meaningful life is to make sure that while you're still living, that you are the absolutely most content and most fulfilled person you could possibly be. And so for me, that means a lot of things. It means that my family is happy, that they are successful, and that they can live a truly fulfilling life, especially since coming to America, they had to grow up in an environment where they had nothing. And so my job as a son, or the job that I want to take on as a son, is to make sure that my family gets to experience all the wonders of the world. Um, number two, it's also about making sure that people of all walks of life who come into my life, who give back to me, can really take something away. Um, because yes, I, I enjoy helping others, but the people I enjoy helping the most are the ones who help me back. And so I want to make sure that the people who have come into my life have, who have given to me so graciously and um, sort of unconditionally that I get to make sure um, that they are getting something back from me, that their investment in me is worth it. Um, and I, I know I have a lot of mentors. I have a lot of coaches. I also have a lot of friends um, who have sat with me during dinner time and said to me in private, Harris, this is what I want. And so um, a meaningful life means that I will be able to respect their wishes and give back to them in those very different ways. Um, and I'd say the last thing for me is to make sure that I, uh, me myself, feel extremely content about all the things that I do. 
that if there ever is an hour of my life where I just feel miserable, that I look back at it and say, all right, something's wrong. Let's fix it and let's pivot and let's turn that miserableness into meaningfulness. You've talked about takeaways earlier. I would have to say on that last question and your answer, I, and I'm sure the audience members listening to this podcast had a lot of takeaways with everything that you've mentioned, which to me are both inspiring and worth emulating. So thank you so much, Harris, for unselfishly sharing yourself and your story with us today. And I want to give you the floor now to let the folks know how best they can reach you, because I'm sure that everyone's like inspired to be part of NAP Boston or to volunteer for programs that you are probably leading or also at the same time to just, you know, um, consult you on anything and everything about API, DIB or LGBTQ plus floor is yours. Let them know how best to reach out to you. Yeah, thank you, Joseph. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me onto this podcast. I had a lot of fun. I'm not just talking to you, but to reflect on my own life. Um, all of your questions um, I thought about for so long before. And so when I'm coming onto your podcast, I have to be challenged to be concise and to really focus on the moments that I care about the most in my life. And so thank you for that. Um, if you want to reach out to me, my email is at harris at getconnected.com. Um, and it's connected with a K. G-E-T-K-O-N-N-I-C-T on dot com. Um, I am available for any speaking opportunities. I'm available for any consulting opportunities. And if you want to pay attention to some of the programs that I lead and want to volunteer, I am all for it. Um, at natboston.org, you can subscribe to our newsletter. We are constantly looking for volunteers. I also have leadership positionings um, opening up at the end of this month. If you would like to apply as a director and join the NAP Austin organization officially, reach out and let us know. And I recently just started the culture vol um, the volunteer um, program at our culture team here at Get Connected. And if you would like to join, um, all you have to do is email me. Um, we can skip the application, especially you'll be one of the first um, five people inside of that cohort um, and help us continue doing work inside of Boston. Lovely. And I'll definitely put all those details on the show notes. The folks can see all of them. And yeah, I just want to wish you, Harris, a very happy Pride for this month of June. Yes. Continue what you're doing. And I'm sure this will not be the last time that we'll be talking to each other. Thank you so much. You got it. Thank you.